Welcome back to the channel. Coming up this week, Stephen visits a robotic milking machine on a farm. Angela goes and visits some potato trials. And also we've been sent this from some of the shocking fires we've seen this week in Herefordshire. Ollie's asked me to do a bit of a short video this afternoon, just to show highlight what sort of happened here 24 hours ago, nearly to the minute. Over to my right, uh, we had a fire breakout in our neighbor's cornfield which is spread across into our land. Very close to damaging major power lines. As you can see, trees, and we've lost 80 to 100 acres a million wheat. Um, it's carried on through to my left here, through into a wood, and carried on through into further fields adjacent behind me. So 11, 11 fire engines on the scene, six um, farmers, neighboring farmers with water bowsers running water to us uh, another six doing fire breaks and stuff and to say the, the um, fire engines have only just sort of left the scene so i've been here for nearly 24 hours so so yeah a bit of an interesting 24 hours so 20 foot high flames yeah very sort of scary times Well, thanks so much to Mick Hickman, who sent that video in for us. We really do appreciate it when we receive videos from you. And we haven't actually reported at all yet from any poultry farms here at the Real Country File. So if you're a poultry farmer and would like to just either showcase um, the type of work that you do or just tell us generally about what the poultry job is like at the moment, then please send your videos in to us at vids at the realcountryfile.co.uk. Now, coming up next, Stephen visits a dairy farm in Lancashire. Hi Stephen, you're at Greenhurst Farm, Samlesbury. We milk 140 Holstein, predominantly Holstein cows, through robotic milking. I'm, I'm a member of the Northwest Dairy Board and a member of the National NFU Dairy Board. Graham, tell us what, what's going on here. <coughs> this is uh, Channel Bank Spotty. She's been milked by the robotic milker. She, she's never known anything else in her life. She comes in three times a day. Loves, she just loves coming in for milking. So, so this machine, tell me a little bit about this machine. What, what are we looking at here? Why have you had this machine? Oh, these were fitted in 2010. They've been milking now for 12 years. They, yeah, they, they've done the job. They milk the cows three times a day. The, the cows come in voluntarily whenever they fancy that cow liberation. So, so, so they come, how many times can they be built? No, can they come in five or six times a day if they want? Yeah, the, the ones when they new carb, the high yielding ones come in five times a day. Just whenever they want to be milked. Um, they've got ac access to the robots every four hours. So are, they get, are they getting a bit of food at the front? Uh, yeah, every time they, oh, they come in, they got, get a little bit of um, we've got action, a little bit of goodies. Stand that way. What's yeah. going on now? So as soon as the flow of the milk for each quarter drops down to point two, as you see there's six on there, it, it takes off that quarter. So it's milking each quarter independently? Each quarter is an individual, yeah. And it's measuring that as it comes out? So it, it measures it, and if there is a problem with it, it, it rings me up. It does what? It rings me up to say, go and have a look at that cow. So if there's a problem with 93, it would say, come and have a look at Spotty. That's... <laughs> this, this technology would be unbelievable. The new ones are even better now. Well, certainly Luke's, Luke's content does... Uh, does your cow oh, Spotty. Spotty, yeah. Yeah, yeah all, all the cows have got names. Um, and they are, they, they're very relaxed about the in terms of your time then, what, what are we saving time wise? It's not necessarily a saving of time, it's just better for the cows. So it's more about cow welfare it's about and cow welfare and looking after them as best as we can. And when you decided to do this, that you know, there's a lot more of them around now, so it's a bit of a leap of faith for yourself. It, yeah, it was a leap of faith that we wanted to milk the cows three times a day. We thought the, the yield they were giving was too much on twice a day. So we, we thought three times a day was e easier for the cows, but we didn't want to put the time commitment for three times a day, four hours per day. So it's all about that, um, that 
the welfare of the, of the actual cow and about that amount of time that would have been required. It, yeah, but you've also got to get a work-life balance as well. As much as you love farming, you, you can't do it 24 hours a day. I appreciate we're on call 24 hours a day, but we're not always about around the farm. So we won't have a look at that side and we, we can look wherever you like. Can have a bit, can enjoy a bit of the sunshine. <laughs> so Graham, I believe a bit of a new venture for you this year in this field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. They say grow older, grow wiser, but I don't, I'm not sure I've got there yet. Um, we were growing 30 acres of barley, spring barley for the cows. We've managed to grow 140 acres of two different types of barley. I'm quite pleased with the way it's done, if I'm honest. It's more about good luck than good management. I've got a lot to thank our agronomist for. He's helped us on every step of the way. So this field has never had that in before. It, this was what was this before? What it's all it's always been grass. Right. Um, the fire field we once grew amazing badly, um, but this year it seems to have just. I suppose the weather's helped as well. And have you got a market for this already? Yeah, it's, it's all, yeah, it's already. Um, it's already spoken for. We can either cut it for the cows or it's wanted for for malting. Some of the barley is malting barley. Some of, it, so some of this is just going for animal feed. And what kind of prices are we looking at difference between? Uh, oh, well, if you, if you can get the barley ware for malting, there's an extra £100 a tonne. Right, OK. So, and so it's a significant difference. Right, so we're, we're kind of fingers crossed, though. We do need a bit more rain, a bit of rain, well, it, as it is. Uh, well, it, it's doing OK. There's such heavy dews in the morning at the moment. But as you can see, the ground started cracking now, which is unusual for uh, this area of Lancashire with 55 inches of rainfall. Is that what? Is that what you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we get per year. Yeah. So, so normally we we never see cracks in the ground. Well, it looks for your first do. I've got to say, it looks rather splendid. Congratulations. I'm, ra I'm rather happy with the way it's gone this time. Good stuff. So Graham, the, the environment is massive on your agenda here on the farm. Is it? How many acres have you got in total on the farm? Uh, there's 400 acres altogether, but um, we've we've generated 10 ponds that we make specially for the wildlife. We dig all the, the dead out of the bottom, straighten it all out. As soon as they fill up, we get rushes and reeds down one side, a couple of trees planted in the middle, just so that the moor hens, etc., can nest in there. We've got snipe, we've got field fair, etc., on fields down there. On ponds that we've done, we've got um, ducks have started coming on, the Canada geese are in there. We've actually got one mandarin duck, a oh. random mandarin duck that's turned up on a pond that we've generated. Why, why do you do this? Because this doesn't put profit on bottom line fit farm does it but it, it doesn't it's just something we're really passionate about we've 64 species of birds on the farm and we're really passionate about what we do to help them we've got to work with nature rather than against it and so this you don't get at the minute you don't get anything extra from the government for digging out fresh new scrapes and ponds no no we don't get anything for any of these jobs that we do right so this is just you about legacy of the environments on your farm then yeah, well, the deer have got to have somewhere to drink, as have the rabbits, etc. So if there's a water hole like this, it's somewhere nice that they can all go to. So big plans for continuing this environment stuff. Definitely. Just as you're going. Definitely. Cracking stuff. The cat seems to like it, you know? Yeah, the cat comes everywhere with it. Graham, it, you've, you're involved in a lot of, you know, committees and uh, involved with farming. What, what's the state of British farming look like for you uh, at the minute? If we can keep Britain farming and we can produce the food, we're only 60% currently self-sufficient in food. So we do need to keep every little bit of farmland we've got available now and keep farming it properly. I think the future's good as long as we look after it properly and look after the farmers and their well-being. Speaking of well-being, you talked about the robot and kind of that work-life balance. If people are kind of umming and ahhing about robot, what, 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 what would your advice be to them? Yeah, as long as you met, as long as you... Yeah, Paul mentally adapt to using computers, you're okay, and you're willing to change, because it's an awful big change from milking in a parlour twice a day. But worth it in the end. I would say so every day. And yeah. happy cows. Happy cows makes happy farmer. Now, I do love a potato. So today, I'm at a potato farm, and they've got a, a trials open day to showcase all of the different varieties that they produce. One of the reasons that they are putting today's event on is to bring together a number of different potato producers around the local region. So by having a, a combined voice, it does give more strength and power when discussing um, business aspects with producers and, and people that buy potatoes in bulk from them. 
So I'm here now with Andrew from Three Shires Potatoes. So uh, Andrew, just give us an overview of, of what's happening here today. Good afternoon. Basically today we have brought together different varieties of potatoes, trialling them and testing them to see what they're like for the future market. So also looking at different fertilisers, um, different levels of farmyard manure, how we can reduce costs for the potato industry. And, and you're a grower yourself, aren't you? So just give us an overview of, of what your farm incorporates. I, yes, I'm a grower. I'm a, well, I'm a, a mixed um, dairy beef potato farmer. We grow about 180 acres of potatoes for the crispy market this year. Um, we have manures from the cows, which we're trying to recycle and put into other crops to reduce costs for the future. And so generally this year, what, what's the potato job like compared to previous years, do you think? It's a very challenging time where the crops have had a good start, but unfortunately the weather with shortage of moisture and water, they're under a lot of pressure. Um, on the back of uh, market pressures as well, uh, there's a surplus of potatoes, unfortunately the price and the general market is under pressure. So with these trial plots that uh, we've got in front of us here, what happens um, in terms of the conclusion or the, the different aspects that you're looking at? What, what does the information help to, uh, to go and prove in the future? We are looking at different varieties, uh, what grows best in which areas and how to grow them to the best of the ability um, to be basically get a better quality potato for our customers. That's what we're trying to do. So what, what sort of uh, involvement have you had on this potato um, plots here? Um, Ollie has been trying this on a variety of different potatoes and as well as that on four other farms in the area so we've actually been trying three different types of rock dust two of them are on a, a trial basis because they've got high potassium levels we've got four different soil types that have been included from heavy clay right the way through to silica sand and peat and we've been trying it on, on the farm here with a control just with normal artificial fertilizer chemical fertilizer the rock dust on its own, the volcanic type, and then the volcanic rock dust with farmyard manure as well. When we have some rain, we will see a, diff a significant difference. I'm absolutely confident of it. Andrew can see what to me, as a geologist, are very slight differences um, from what he's told me this morning. Without rock dust, the plants are starting to show, show some stress for, from the lack of water, which the rock dust seems to be helping the potato plants to hold up a little bit better. And so, Newcastle University, I believe that you have a, a student um, potentially starting some analysis on this in September? It will be one of our project students, their final year project. Uh, we'll look at the soils and look at the effect on the soils of the application of the rock dust and then tie that in with the, the recordings of the amount of yield and other properties that are measured during the harvest so that we can then do a statistical analysis and see whether or not there are significant differences that are associated with the application of rock dust. But what we do beyond that is we look at the processes, the science if you like, behind the claims that are made for the availability of nutrients from these rocks and that's something we, we specialise in. Um, so we, we try to give a, a robust foundation and we also also look at the carbon capture potential of these rocks because when you put them on the soil they're there as a rock powder and you add them to the soil and they'll naturally weather in the soil and that weathering process takes CO2 out of the atmosphere so what we're able to do working with information that Agrimagine gives us is to estimate what that CO2 removal is so that that's another benefit that can be quantified by applying them to land. So I'm just here now with Alistair from Signet Potato Breeders and they're one of the largest independent potato breeders of the country. So Alistair's just going to give us a, a brief overview of how you actually um, create a new variety. Okay, this is, <coughs> this is done under glasshouse conditions, so not out in a field like this, but basically we take uh, a flower from uh, having picked the two parents we take a flower, now these yellow parts of the flower, we do this before they're opened up, but uh, these are the pollen sacs, so that there, 
to use pollen sack, we take them out of the stage where they're full of pollen and we pull these off with tweezers rather than big agricultural hands. Yeah, you'd normally do these in polytunnels, yeah. would you? Yeah. So what's left there is the, the plants or the flowers ovary. Uh, so that now is a female flower. And uh, we then go to a different parent. <coughs> So then we'll take the pollen sacs from that parent and I usually do this, my breeder would be horrified with me, but we tap out, I tap out the pollen onto my thumbnail and then rub the ovary into the pollen that's been extracted. She does this onto a razor blade but uh, rub the pollen onto uh, there and then we just mark that with a label on the plant and that uh, should, if that's been successful, develop into a tomato-like structure and because uh, it's the same family, potatoes are the same family as tomatoes, Solanaceae, and within that tomato we'll have between 50 and 300 seeds and every one of those seeds at that stage is a separate individual variety and then all the rest that follows on that you see in this field comes from that one cross. We take the seeds, we extract them, extract them from the tomato and then sow them the following year in the glass house and uh, in their family groups. All of the seed from one tomato is kept together as a family and then uh, we follow that right through into the field in the first generation and then onwards we do lots of testing and eventually whittle that down to in 10 or 12 years time hopefully one successful variety. So there's certainly a lot more science behind growing the perfect potato than I ever realised, but I do know that it's made me feel like having potatoes for my tea. I hope you've enjoyed it this week. We've had about 20 mil of rain actually in, on Friday and Saturday. So what have you had this week? Otherwise we've not had any rain for a good few weeks. So let us know in the comments if you've had it continuously dry or not. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you next week.